This is the Cheers Podcast. Hi, I'm Patrick Everett, and this is the Cheers Podcast. Today, I want to reflect on the recent Rio Grande LNG air permit public meeting that happened in Brownsville, Texas on March 8, 2018. Additionally, I will speak about the social economic development, professionalism, organizing the community, and the political narrative. So the oil and gas industry is increasing operations here in the Rio Grande Valley with refineries, pipelines, compressor stations, and the LNG export facilities being constructed at the port of Brownsville. The pipelines will be delivering gas from the U.S. to Mexico, with some local leaders claiming to be without any environmental footprint, and other local leaders repeat the same economic development lullaby about bringing desperately needed jobs to this area. The foreign trade zone is ranking the port of Brownsville second in the U.S. in 2016, with more than $2.8 billion in export value, along with the port ranking in the top five nationally for exports every year since 2012. The port has been doing a great job for some time. Once again, there's more need for development to help create those needed jobs that promise progress and higher standards of living for this region. The Mexican energy reform has increased demand for more energy density, which has led to the hiring of more of the population to work in non-unionized jobs where these employees don't have some stock of ownership at least. The same economic development story is being repeated here an area where we also have thousands of currently employed people that need a better livable standard that is not currently being met right now. Therefore, there is an even greater need to ensure for increase in investment, job security, and democratization. Instead of attracting large corporate entities that we have little control over, we should instead tap into other economic potentials in which we are excellent in, like science, education, food, culture, music, art, history, manufacturing, te- telecommunications, transportation, and retail, to name a few. These LNG jobs are not necessarily needed or required to deliver progress in this community. The community's progress is not defined by outside interests, but by us, our interests. Unfortunately, I think the day will come when we will self-righteously wring our fists in the air and defeat when, the, when they grant authorization and these job cre- creators become our unsustainable energy sources of production. Our comments and concerns documented in process. Nevertheless, we are left with dissatisfaction and powerlessness. This self-inflicted antagonism by our local leaders of pitting humans against each other is not new in this economic system. It is part of the permit process, and it's well understood that the public may contest permits, but everything about the permitting to pollute is a political and economic question that the air permit specifically does not address. The permit process will be followed, and the company will be established in a community that needs uh, job security and a bucket list of other issues to resolve. The area does not have other heavy polluters yet to approach the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, but I will talk about those standards and contesting the permit after you hear a brief Q&A I had with Arturo Alonso and then, from a me- and then from members of the community that submitted formal comments during the public meeting. I hope our local leaders can be inspired by the Pope's words to take care of creation. St. Francis wanted that. People occasionally forgive, but nature never does. And if we don't take care of the environment, there's no way of getting around it. Let me give you an example of not taking good care of the local social ecology. The following are paraphrased sentiments between the majority group and the minority group in the public meeting. The majority group was against the exporting plants and the minority group are for the exporting plants. Here it goes. A veteran man says, We uh, we were forced to go to war so you could have freedom. Freedom to reject these LNG plants. We are poor and sick already and need money to pay from unsustainable sources of energy. But poverty runs deep in this valley. We will earn wages no matter if it pollutes, kills, or harms others. We are polluting now. Why stop or reduce it? One group says, jobs, so the kids can have a future here. The other group says, clean jobs, so our kids can have a future here. Another veteran man says, we need better jobs from companies like LNG. They will come in anyway looking for progress in unsustainable energy companies. An elderly man says, There is nothing here. My my kids have left to find jobs. I want my grandkids to stay here. Another elderly man says, 
that oil and gas companies are necessary evils. We need it. A third elder, elderly man says, we need more Democrats. That one, that one actually made me laugh. Okay. As you can see, both groups have a similar definition of progress for this area that we can reconcile as their missions are the same. Both groups want better jobs for the area but are now fighting each other. The question now is, will the fighting within the community continue and erode our, social, our local social ecology like what happened in Quintana, Quintana, Texas, where Freeport LNG used strategies to divide and conquer the town? For residents in Quintana, Texas, the media reported that first they used carrots. Over the next two years, Freeport LNG plowed tens of thousands of dollars into the town's coffers to placate the town's leadership. It offered homeowners a 25000 inconvenient fee per household, compensation for bearing the noise and dust from construction. When those effects failed to win over many folks, the sticks came out. Freeport LNG pushed residents, residents to sell their homes to, companies, uh, to the company quickly and pledged to withhold payment until the company received approval from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Freeport LNG buyout strategy pitted residents who were starch opponents of the project against those who weren't convinced they could stop the company or saw a situation as an opportunity to move away. The ensuing debate tore the town apart. In the spring of 2014, almost half of the residents uh, of Kitana, many of whom had signed Dottie's petition to stop the LNG export plants, submitted a second petition, this time in support of the project. Within uh, another year, the company had purchased the vast majority of the island's, the island's 70 or so homes, tearing down many of them. As Quintana residents moved out to Freeport LNG, rented the homes it had purchased to its workers. Eventually, the town elected two company employees to the five-member town council. In a matter of two years, Quintana went from beach town to company town. Quintana was a very tiny town compared to this area. Can this area create a sustainable community that prevents the degradation of our local social ecology? Our area does need economic development that is scientifically harmonious with the natural world and sustainable progress defined by moving away from unsustainable energy sources, not just in the economic term. It needs to be consistent with the community's values that should not be belittled or toyed with by global market interests, either in Mexico or in Asia. If our local leaders recognize the emergency presented by climate change, they would join the majority of the scientific community and prohibit these types of industries from entering th into this community. Currently, there are no democratic institutions, either locally or statewide, that are responsive to this global uh, emergency, and we need local leaders leading on this front. The words of social ecologist Murray Bookchin eliminates that it is the socially constructed relationships in a hierarchy that set the conditions for environmental degradation and commodifying environmental protection, justice, compliance, enforcement, ethics into single issues to be resolved by individual responsibility. Mer uh, Bookchin states that the notion that man must dominate nature emerges uh, directly from the domination of man by man, not until organic community relations dissolved into market relations that the planet itself were, was reduced to a resource for exploitation. This century-long tendency finds its most exacerbating development in modern capitalism. Owing to its inherently competitive nature, bourgeoisie society not only pits humans against each other, it also pits the mass of humanity against the natural world. Just as man has converted into commodities, so every aspect of nature is converted into a commodity, a resource to be manufactured and merchandised wantonly. The plundering of the human spirit by the marketplace is paralleled by the plundering of the earth by capital. Something to learn about Bookchin is that he wants sustainable development, but considering social, environmental, economical, and ecological aspects in a more localized democratic process. A local leader support these old forms of energy production. You can find their uh, public statements and allegedly claim to be environmental stewards. The water infrastructure bills are non-controversial. The clean school bus grants are only voluntary. And the environmental education summits that have become more of a, a political event than a comprehensive community development project. The understated achievements that some local counties and municipalities needs to be highlighted more. The environmental summit needs to be needs to scale up and go beyond individual responsibility practices and redefine the current definition of sustainable economic development in line with the community's values. Individual action alone, such as ethical consumerism, is not enough and requires more nuanced eth ethical thinking and organization grounded in local democratic ideals. Maybe a good exercise for environmentalists in the RGB 
is the creation of these democratic ecological institutions for school districts, municipalities, counties, businesses, and neighborhoods. Yelling, doing your job, and expecting environmental justice from the state environmental agency is good passion, but only will be documented and will not revise their uh, mission statement. Channel that energy into learning about the contesting permit process, like the deadlines for the motions to overturn and rehearing the uh, permit applications. I see some fundraising in the local groups resisting the permit, but if you haven't already, start organizing a legal team and legal fund from crowdfunding services. This is definitely, un there is definitely uncertainty if lo local leaders can actually successfully block incoming permits as their support for eight, uh, House Bill 40 demonstrates they are they may be setting up a show of resistance in name only. The local Democratic Party leadership in Hidalgo County and Cameron County may nominally resist the permit process, but, uh, but no, the municipalities and counties are powerless to block these oil and gas entities from establishing themselves due to House Bill 40. The amendments added by Eddie Trevino III attempting to provide some local authority should be recognized, such as enforcing subsurface safety valves during hurricanes or other catastrophe events, or even the Texas Railroad Commission has not taken uh, action to enforce state law, or granting TCEQ to delegate authority to municipalities or other political subdivisions to inspect facilities using oil and gas operations for compliance enforcement within their jurisdiction. These amendments were tabled, and Lucio and Rene Oliveira ended up supporting House Bill 40, and the nominal resistance continues. We need to create a roadmap and a compelling political narrative that local leaders can echo consistently. Bring in and activate sympathizers. Organize into a larger political force that can lobby local leaders effectively and professionally. However, if the local leaders do not reconsider their current positions in writing, then it could become their institutional challenger for the long term. Don't only settle for symbolic contestation, but institutional contestation with professionalism, which leads me to my next thought. I just had Arturo Alonso on the show who used some name calling similar to what Trump does in public discourse to show his disapproval with the Cameron County Democratic Party leadership. That's his style of discourse. I personally don't create nicknames without some categorization like an adjective. But anger, anger is a powerful emotion. During the public meeting, there was a lot of angry name calling like vendidos or house slaves to critique the current reality. I think that it's not constructive in this specific public process, and I see it as an offensive if representatives present are following procedure. I understand that this is a preliminary per permission by local and state government. It's offensive to opponents of the air permit. But speak with authority and poise if you want your comment publicly documented to convey an informed opinion or reveal or overlook potential of harm by the application, specifically affecting you in a way not common to the general population. Lastly, correcting the moderator's pronunciation of Hispanic names may be perceived as judgmental for a guy that doesn't live here, who probably doesn't speak Spanish, and would not pronounce the name correctly. If he is here because he has to be, be his neighbor. Know his role and the process. That is my personal critique of the minority of the people who submitted public comments. You don't have to agree with my critique, but I hope people can see these public meetings as signs that the process is being followed, and we need to prepare with a roadmap of some, uh, symbolic and institutional challenges towards these LNG companies and local leaders for the long term. Those are my thoughts on the recent uh, Rio Grande LNG air permit public meeting that happened in Brownsville, Texas. Next, you will hear a short Q&A I had with Arturo Alonso regarding his experience during the public meeting. After that, you will get to hear from eight people representing the majority that opposed the permit and four people uh, representing the minority that support the permit. As a note, there were only four people that submitted formal oral comments who supported the permit. And I only picked eight people who opposed the permit to show the degree of support and opposition, as well as for time. Well, now it's time to discuss the, the recent uh, Rio Grande Valley LNG air permit uh, public hearing that Arturo and I went to. It uh, happened on March 8th, uh, 2018 at the Brown Brownsville Event Center. So I, I went to this public hearing to hear the community's concerns uh, regarding the, the soon-to-be-established liquid natural gas exporting facilities. Uh, I saw you get up there during the informal discussion period where members of the public can have a Q&A with, the T with TCEQ staff and the applicant, which is a Rio Grande Valley LNG. I saw what I consider a political grandstand that forced the moderator to take a break. Uh, what happened? Tell us what you wanted to do by doing that. Yes. Um, I went out there as somebody from Brownsville, Texas, somebody who lives really close where these facilities are actually are being created 
And the only thing I wanted was an answer. And my greatest fear is that our kids get higher rates of asthma, that our air pollution and our water pollution is going to be extremely, um, it's going to be drastically affected, like directly affected by the 8,134,000 greenhouse emissions um, that this data is actually were given by them, right, to us. And here's the thing. Um, I just want an answer and saying, how safe is it? B, where can we find stats of LNG and um, the effects on our health? Because if they're asking us for permission, here's the thing. If we have invested X number of dollars in the Laguna, um, in the Bahia Grande area for fishing, and we currently have a population with 46, 46%, I'm sorry, with 46% of our people not having any health insurance. And we have an LNG company that's coming in and saying, we're going to create jobs. We're going to make sure that the environment's safe. Then I want to make sure that it is. A, B, um, we cannot be having investment in our fishing industry when we have the water, right? So when you frack, right, you push water out and all this contaminated water is then going to be pushed out. Where is it going to be pushed out in the Gulf of Mexico, right? So my issue is this. Don't kill the fishes. Don't kill our fishing industry. Ensure that we're safe. And give me some information to ensure that when you're coming in, I A, we have the stats, and B, we're able to ourselves regulate it, right? One way or another, work with you. I'm not saying that there are these big, greedy guys who are just coming in to destroy our environment. I'm saying is this take us in consideration, take care, um, take consideration our health. And what scared me the most, Patrick is that there's no stats. There's no stats. Nobody can say out of X number of emissions, X is produced. And is this LNG's fault? Um, LNG, what's the name of the company? Real Grand LNG. Is that their fault? Because when I asked them, they had none. Is this the EPA's fault? Is this UTRGV's fault? Is this Rene Oliveira's fault? Whose fault is it? Right? And when you're not able to give an answer, that's scary. That's my only thing when I had it with them. And because our air is still virgin and it's still healthy yeah, and it's not contaminated like Corpus or Houston. Yeah. Right. We have a no man's line of production. Well, you have, yeah, you have an opportunity because there's no other refineries. Well, there's going to be two coming in, but there's going to, there's the industrialization is still. Uh, so we're virgin. Right, right. Hence we can abuse because we still have a room that it's yeah. not too hazardous because we're in in the no man's land, right? So yeah. if you look at tennis, you have um, your baseline, you have no man's land, and you have what you serve, right? We're still in the serving like center, like like we still haven't been tampered with, and we have good quality air. But in the nomadic land, right, um, in the no man's land, there's still room for production because the EPA or whoever says, or the state of Texas, whoever says that if it passes a certain threshold. Now it's dangerous. Yeah. So that's where you have the city of uh, San Antonio, Austin, Houston. All of them, they're, they have monitors throughout the city. And so they, they get very close to those federal standards, those thresholds. Mm -hmm. and, and so for us, when you incorporate everything and they put into their projections, their models, and, uh, and they get the best available technology to determine all this stuff, um, they show that, yeah, they're fine. Right? Like you're, you'd be there, you won't be... Com uh, uh, impacting the public as much you won't be impacting the environment as much because there's still room for you to emit and then we have to make the decision right if we want that to occur right exactly like, and for me it comes down to the issue of democracy when it comes to this issue not not say because they're going to come in with the, the economic development which, which always 150 jobs yeah which they come in with that and we're like a third world country and this new neo, neo, neoliberal practice of going to the cheapest labor areas and uh, put jobs there, but not unionized jobs, just, just, just jobs. Just and not jobs. even the local people are bringing their own. Yeah. And, and it's always, it's always uh, the leadership that allows this to happen. But the majority of the people who are against it, which when I went to the public meeting, the majority in the room who went to this public meeting, were, how many were they? 
I don't know. We could. I, I could guess probably around a hundred. hundred. I think there was give or take. Yeah, give or take because people. It was a pretty packed room, and I think in one I side. I think it was anything between a, like a hundred or two hundred. Like because w one side had everybody packed, but there was also empty chairs. Yeah. Well, let's say between what fifty to two hundred. I don't know. I, I I know it was a really big crowd compared to the other public hearing that uh, LN, the other LNG and, facility and, had. And there was a faction that wasn't even from the lower Rio Grande. They were from like Hidalgo, right? So let's take that in consideration. There were people from Benitas. There was people from... Oh, there's... I don't know where they were coming from. There were people from Houston. All over the place. They were um, concerned about this permit. But I think that... I agree with you. Um, here's my only thing. I, I care about our public health. Uh, and if we have been an area historically not affected with the highest level, here's the thing. We have 46% of our people without any health insurance. We have the highest rates of cervical cancer in the state of Texas. Our women are 1.5 times more likely to get cervical cancer, 1.4 times more likely of actually dying of cervical cancer once they have it, compared to Anglo-Saxon white women. We have an 89% hike in HIV AIDS in kids between 14 to 35. Um, we already have these public health issues. Let's not add. And if we do decide to add because our air is virgin and we still have room for improvement, then the only thing we have to do then, I'll say, is make sure that 100% of those workers come from this district, period. And that every single worker is unionized. And that every single worker is getting paid more than $15 and an hour. And if it's not that, then I don't want you, right? But then when you tell that to the steel mill that's trying to come over here, it's like, oh, you want union workers? Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to no, go somewhere else. No, then go somewhere else. Here's the thing. We're the only campaign that said, let's make sure that our district becomes, by 2026, 100% fueled by renewable energy. We can do that. Those are jobs. We can invest in our... I don't want my kid... Here's the thing. We tell our kids this. That's what he thought in first grade. You become GT. Muy chingon. You can become the president of Arturo. You can go to college. You know, the American dream is awesome. Tú estás morenito, güey. You're regular. Here's a wrench. Go learn the skill. Go to work. Um, we have to be able to understand that even our school system already has this condition in this manner. The people that I went to school with who were GT, Yale, Jose Alberto Delgado ended up going to Cornell. He works for Goldman, uh, Goldman Sachs or whatever. Um, the people that I went to school with became extremely successful and they left. And I define success by not being able to live day by day, <laughs> right? Yet the people that I played football with, those who those who were in ESL, those who spoke Spanish, those who were of Raza, those from Cameron Park, bro, we're here and they're making $9.10. And if you're going to come and bring jobs here, you're going to respect our people. For me, it's about an issue about respect. Right, I don't see why why you want to be shortchanging our workers. If you want to shortchange our workers, then go to China, bro. Like straight up, go to Mexico. Like build that refinery in Mexico. I don't care because we keep on. Here's the catch twenty two. They bring in our people. They say jobs. They make them part time workers. They bring in their own people, they get our profits, they leave, they spend it elsewhere, our economies become weaker and weaker, we have more people on food stamps, like working people, bro. Yeah, yeah, they go to Walmart and Walmart literally tells them, go get some food stamps because we're and not going to offer you So benefits. we're paying for their tax cuts Yeah, and we're paying for the people that have made peasants and the people that they've made literally like scared, the people get in the Jesus in la boca and no, dude, like. I'm, I'm not a radical. I'm not a communist. Um, I'm a person that's saying, if you're going to come here, please help us have clean. Like, if we cannot stop them, at least make sure that the production and the quality of our air is still protected. Right? And we, if we do have room, let's make sure it's at the lowest level. Right? But you're not going to pay our workers 10 bucks. That's pero bien pendejo. You're not going to have our people without health insurance. And you're going to make sure that if a worker stays there, they have a good retirement. That's an issue that we have too, right? Like our workers are working at these companies and every single senior here lives with a child of theirs. And every single child lives with their parent. Because the kid cannot leave the house because he's making seven fifty or 9 bucks. And 9 bucks, you cannot leave your house. Like no mames. No. Like no se puede. Una, dos. When your mom becomes 65, she's going to live with you.
Why? Because she has no retirement. And we need to be able to make people fully independent and empower them with the basic things they need to escape poverty. All right. So the moderator, when he went into the formal comment period after your questions and comments, uh, taken away the opportunity for others to submit their questions and comments. Uh, when it comes to these high profile public hearings that have a process in place per se and uh, allow everyone that wants to participate to do so, uh, what do you say to the people that think that you took time from others that in interrupted the process? I think that I did not interrupt the process in the sense that we put we set the theme to the questions that we're going to were going to be asked, right? And we set the stage of they they think that they're in control. And it's like, no, bro, you are in our own home turf, right? They're asking us for permission to come and bring in their company to a certain extent, right? And we are inviting them to come over. Like, that's the way that I see it, right? Like, like our politicians said, our politicians are representatives of the people. Right. So we, the people say, hey, um, come and bring jobs. And now they're asking us, hey, can we come in? And it's a mutual level of respect. Right. So when the gentleman, right, was not able to ask questions, when I saw a consistent pattern of passing the baton, oh, just email us. Oh, just do this. Oh, we don't know. And then you're not the expert. Then bring us somebody else. Because if I work for, for example, if I was a representative for Catherine Cortez Masos or the Hillary Clinton campaign, you asked me something specific to them, I'm going to answer the question. I don't need to tell you, oh, no, you need to go, because I am the head of that organization, right? Same thing here. And I think that my questions were specific. They did not give us an answer, but it also allowed for a lot of people to be either A, inspired, or C, um, ask questions, but what I don't agree is you're not going to degrade an individual. Um, I think that if you're going to push, you're going to push with, with, with professionalism. I never degraded any of the staff members. Um, I made sure that he didn't walk all over me. He was like, no, 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 no. But it's like, here's, here's a question. Answer it. Here's a question. Answer it. Answer it. That's all I said. We don't have of people at large who have ever participated in politics. And when you have this side, the panel, dictating and saying, this is the way we're going to do things, I don't think there will be as many. Like, we had such a large crowd actually asking questions, sharing their personal stories. We had a lot of women in the room which is not representative of our own democracy here. We had people in English and in Spanish. We had my mom. My mom has never been in a political event, and she went there with her comadres. That, for me, was unique. Um, and that's why I went up there and I asked those questions. And if it got heated and people, well, we took a 10-minute break, it allowed people to be more like, okay, I... I think I can do it too. But did you notice that he uh, he cut the informal session to the and then went into the formal session, which basically you have to sign, come in early, sign up, so you could actually show that you're yeah, going to. But here, that's a that's comment. a cowardly act. Here's the thing: if I'm going to go to any city um, and represent any LNG company or any entity or any whatever, I'm going to be the expert. And if you ask me a question, I'm going to get the answer. If I don't have, if I come in with four other dudes, right, who don't have laptops, who don't have, their, none of them have their notes up, right? Why didn't we have a projector with graphs? Like, these guys came in super frat boy. Muy, muy chingon, super frat boy. Oh, we're just going to go over there. We're going to take, I don't know, the history of rock and roll. I don't know if you guys ever took that in college or like a class that you don't respect, Right. I mean, you go to a class you don't respect, you don't have known any nouns. That was not professional. Um, it is their job and their duty to provide us with all the resources that we need to actually ask the most educated questions. 
we don't have those resources. If it's safety LNG from the RGV actually doing the research, mm -hmm. like literally a nonprofit, then no, I think it's wrong. And I think that a lot of the issues when we had these questions that were extremely disrespectful on one end, I don't think we had a lot. I think most people were prudent and were well-versed and asked good questions, but our people don't have the information. I want us to make the most informed decision with the most informed people and then together decide, A, do we want them here or no? But not, here's the thing, when people don't have education, they become radical. We don't have the resources. Give us the resources. Let's sit in the table. Let's have a dialogue. And if they're not the most equipped, then bring us the most equipped. Um, but here's the thing. I, I think that they were the most equipped. They just didn't have any notes. Well, um, for me, when I, I know about the public hearing process, it's just part of the legal requirements to, get the, to obtain the permit. So all the comments that you put in, all the concerns that people put in, they do get evaluated. They do get reviewed. And, and they might incorporate certain things in the permit to cover that. But in the end, that's that's pretty much it. It's just a procedure so they could get the permit. Uh, everything else, yes, it gets reviewed, that it gets tweaked, but it doesn't withdraw the permit, no yeah. matter how much you yell or scream. I think I think that that needs to change. I think that we need well, to be. There's a, a process. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry about that. I didn't want mm -hmm. to interrupt you. In no, 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 no. It's it's. But there, that's a process. There, there is a process right now in play, so you could contest the permits but a lot of people don't know that process and like you're just saying right now can you educate me on that yeah, process people could edu uh, people could get educated uh, for me right now you could always go into the TCQ's website and find TC yeah, TCEQ's website and find guidance documents when it comes to contesting the permit like application like the real formalities and the way the procedure yes. has to go yeah. um here's the thing you're the only person um Patrick that's like doing this you and like lng like i'm i didn't see the media there you didn't see the media did you see the media yeah their media was there all over um, the but they when they read wrote an article it was like a one page article a one pager like five like five body paragraphs of some yeah a it, sentence of pop i read it and i was like it didn't capture what was going on in there i think we need to be able to make the most informed decision. Um, you can protest. You can do all you want, as you said, and we're not able to do X or Y, but we don't have an attorney backing the people, right? Like, um, There's attorneys here, but they're busy doing other things. No, no. I mean, an attorney, here's the thing. Like, Where was the city attorney of Brownsville? Oh. Yeah, no, the local leadership is actually for LNG, so they're not going to show up. Um, I, that's my opinion because one i think that our city attorneys like that in itself i don't understand when i go to other cities um you have specific like laredo you have an attorney representing las colonias and he works with the county and whenever there's a public hearing or whenever there's anything like he goes out there and he says no like this is where my stand is and um Maybe it's because we don't have a nonprofit. Maybe it's because we don't have a media outlet that's able to truly educate the public on these matters. Um, and if our politicians are the ones that are supporting it blindly, meaning, yes, we support it because we support it uh, and not make it the process more democratic, then I think we should run people for office. That song is called Adventures by Himichu, available on Spotify. This is a public meeting on an application by Rio Grande LNG, LLC. It's for proposed air quality permit numbers 140792 PSD TX1498 and GHG PSD TX158. This is the formal comment period for tonight's public meeting. This is your opportunity to submit comments on the record that you want TCQ staff or the commissioners to consider before making any final decisions on the application. 
You will not receive a response to your comments tonight. Instead, the comments that you submit tonight will be combined with all the written comments that have been submitted on this application already. And any comments that we get after tonight's meeting, because the comment period doesn't close until March 26th, um, so they'll be combined with all those comments. And the ex executive director staff will respond to those comments in, in a document called the response to comments. Uh, the response to comments gets mailed out to everyone who is on the mailing list, including those who provide comments on the application. Uh, as I mentioned before, I've got about 40 folks who have signed up to give comments tonight. Uh, so for that reason, I'm going to put you on a three-minute time limit. Uh, once you hit three minutes, I will call time, ask you to take a seat, and then call up the next person. Uh, again, if you don't make it through all of your comments, you can sit down and start writing. Uh, written comments carry the same weight as oral comments. Or again, you have until March 26th to uh, submit your comments. Uh, I'll give you a one-minute warning. I'll just say one minute, uh, and then at time, I'll call time. So Nadine. Good evening. My name is Nadine Smith, and I'm a city commissioner of place number six from the city of Laguna Vista. I want to remind this commission that the city of Laguna Vista unanimously voted and created a resolution against all LNG development. I want to state my disdain and disappointment that despite the violent opposition and protest from local residents, our voices are being ignored and I feel we are not being heard. I want to remind this commission that at the rate we are going, there is going to be no natural habitat left for our children and their children to enjoy. It is our responsibility and duty to protect the little nature that we have left, including the air that we breathe. The prevailing wind in Laguna Vista is southeast, which puts our town and its approximately 5,000 residents directly in the path of all pollution that's coming from these terminals. And I'm appalled that all of us, including all the small children and my three small children, will breathe this air. So I'm asking that on behalf of, behalf of the city of Laguna Vista and our future generations that you consider these things, but more importantly, I'm asking you, and I'm saying that all of you guys that's approving this permit does not live here, and that's incredibly annoying to me, no offense. I'm asking that if you lived right next to these terminals, if you had small children living right next to these terminals, would you approve it? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is Dina Nunez. Given that TCQ failed to provide Spanish translation today, I will be providing translation for Dina Nunez. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Dina Núñez, soy líder comunitaria eh, por 10 años en Laguna Heights con el Comité de Vecinos por el Bienestar de la Comunidad Costera. Good evening, my name is Dina Núñez and I am a leader and group member of Vecinos para el Bienestar de la Comunidad Costera. A lo largo de estos 10 años he visto la gran necesidad que existe en esta comunidad de bajos recursos con problemas de salud, eh, di vivienda digna y derechos laborales. Over the course of 10 years, I have seen the great need that exists in the community of Laguna Heights, a community that is primarily low income, that faces many adversaries from um, wage theft and other necessities in the community. Son personas que viven del turismo en hoteles, trabajando en hoteles, restaurantes y en la pesca, limpiando cuartos, cocinando, cortando yardas, eh, pescando y, tra y son trabajos temporales. The residents who live in this community depend on tourism. They work as cooks, fishermen, gardeners, housekeepers, servers, and cashiers. Their financial stability is dependent on these low-wage jobs that are seasonal. Como representante de esta comunidad vulnerable, pedimos a nuestros representantes aquí presentes de TCAQ que nieguen los permisos a estas plantas de Rio Grande LNG por las siguientes razones. As a community leader of this vulnerable community, we ask the representatives here today to deny the air permit to the Rio Grande LNG plants for the following reasons. Durante un año hemos hablado sobre los riesgos de la contaminación en el medio ambiente de agua, tierra, aire, fauna silvestre y la salud de nuestras familias. For a year, we have organized as a group to talk about the contamination risk that the Rio Grande uh, LNG plants will bring to the community, how it will impact the environment, the water, the land, the air, the beautiful wildlife, and the health of our families. Estas familias de Laguna Hat tienen una población en el que 81% de las familias tienen problemas con el asma por no tener acceso a un seguro médico y buscan atención médica en las clínicas y hospitales más cercanos en las áreas de Brownsville. 
81% of families in Laguna Heights are low income. Due to this, many families lack health insurance. This has perpetuated many health problems for both adults and children. Many children in the community have asthma. There's also lack of access to medical resources, such as health clinics. The nearest hospital is in Brownsville, which is a 30-minute drive from Laguna Heights. Concientizando que a largo plazo el LNG empeoraría nuestro ambiente contaminando el aire, lanzando contaminantes nocivos y polvo eh, más veces que la planta contaminante del condado Cameron. The LNG facility will worsen our community environment. It will contaminate the air and emit hazardous chemicals, making the facility the most contaminated facility of pollutants in Cameron County. Además, dañaría el turismo, la pesca comercial, lo cual significaría menos empleos para estas familias. It will hurt and decrease to tourism and commercial fishing, which would mean less employment for the residents who depend on these jobs every day. ¿Por qué? Porque los trabajos que LNG dice que crearía a corto plazo requieren habilidades que estas comunidades no califican. Y pido a nuestros representantes y funcionarios electos aquí presentes que protejan la salud y la seguridad de los empleos y los empleos de esta comunidad sensible y vulnerable al negarle los permisos para no contaminar nuestro ambiente. Gracias. Why, why is the LNG promoting that will create jobs when in reality this is only short term because the reality is that the facility is going to require a specialized skill set to liquefy the gas, which means that many community residents in Laguna Heights might not have. Um, so today I stand before you and ask you to protect our health and environment and secure the jobs that our community depends on by denying the LNG the air permit. Thank you, Dina Nunez. Thank you. Uh, Timothy Jarvis. Hello, my name is Dr. Timothy Jarvis, as it says on the paper. I'm an environmental toxicologist. I also have in my record set the cleanup levels for 78 Superfund sites and was senior research scientist for National Labs for the cleanup of our largest nuclear waste site. I know emissions. I know what they can do. I'm the person who tells you why you have a concentration of adrenal cancers in an area. I'm also the person that tells you why your six-year-old granddaughter has leukemia. I have read your draft permit application. You gave a draft permit application for a cancer factory. This is really below the belt. This document should be five to six volumes. And please take note, every factor in here should be independently third-party verified. I should be able to pick this document up and recreate every number. I cannot. I have to take it on faith. And what I see is over 600 tons of volatile emissions, which could be 234 TCDD, the most toxic compound we have, dioxin. It's non-nuclear. There's nothing in this document that says it's not, and we have a facility that could produce it. So you, as the protector of our public health, are really at fault for not protecting our health. We should be able to know it. This permit as it's so-called, because this is a joke. This is a real joke. This should be five to six volumes. Have one now, minute. Thank you. Yes, do your job. Let's know. This, have, is, uh, this is environmental. Uh, it's Dr. Jarvis's time. Go ahead. Okay. And I do not appreciate the hostility that I get from TCEQ. This is really uncalled for. You are here to protect the public health. That is your mandate. Why do you hate the public? If you don't like it, leave your job. Thank you. Thank you. Sergio Contreras. Jim. Jim, you come 
Did we get it? Okay. Sergio Contreras. Hello, yes. Yeah, Sergio Contreras with the RGB Partnership, proud father of two. One's about to be four this coming Monday. In fact, this morning he said, Daddy, can you take me to the beach for my birthday? So I, uh, I appreciate, I love our ocean. I, as I do plan to bring him to the island, I do also work as a father to ensure that he has a, there's opportunities for him as far as emerging and innovative uh, job opportunities. That is what our goal is as parents. With safety measures in mind, liquefied natural gas will bring job diversity and investment to the RGV. It's an exciting time to be in the Valley. Tremendous economic growth. It will bring life-changing opportunities for our work current and future workforce. With safety first, while much has been discussed about the economic benefits, I want to emphasize that the RGV Partnership, a community business-minded organization, like many other groups, support bringing the LNG business to the Valley because of the industry, strong safety, and environmental records. Today's public meeting is a testament to the measures taken by Rio Grande LNG. TCEQ has issued a preliminary determination in favor of the Rio Grande LNG's air permit application. Rio Grande LNG continues to demonstrate their commitment to safety and environmental responsibility and economic development. Your assessment that the emissions of air contaminants for the proposed facility, which are subject to PSD review, prevention of significant deterioration, will not violate any state or federal air quality regulations and will not have any significant adverse impact on soils, vegetation, or visibility. All air contaminants have been evaluated and best available control technology will be used for the control of these contaminants. Your assessment is valuable since it provides the opportunity to move to the next step. Liquefied natural gas is made from the same natural gas that is piped directly into homes for cooking and heating. In fact, LNG facilities cool the gas to minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit to convert it to liquid so that it can be more easily and more efficiently transported. One minute. As a liquid, liquid LNG is not explosive, nor is it stored under pressure. The potential risk is to environmental is minimal. It is always kept in enclosed systems, onboard ships, and in land-based LNG unloading lines and tanks. As a result, the U.S. LNG industry has a strong safety record for more than 70 years without an incident impacting the public or the environment. Hiring local. They've been building relationships in our local community as they develop a, 20, a potential $20 billion investment in our, in our region. Once in place, we'll provide 200 full-time jobs and all from all trades. That is why we are in support of the that we, and we actually support the in rule in favor of a Rio Grande LNG air permit application. I will be providing written comments. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, hold on. So my name is Josette Cruz, and I was raised here in Brownsville, and I currently reside here. I am also a mother of two young daughters, one of which is special needs. It is a shame that I even have to stand here before you today and remind you all that my children and the people of the RGV have a right, a human right, to clean air. If built, these LNG facilities will be the largest single source emitters of air pollution in Cameron County. And I should not have to worry about my children developing asthma or other respiratory illnesses due to the pollution from Rio Grande LNG. As a mother who is at an elevated or who will be or potentially be at an elevated risk to air pollution, I am also concerned for the rest of the women who will be potentially exposed to the carbon monoxide, which can harm the pregnant women and their fetuses. I am not alone. We, sitting here tonight, are not alone. Our brothers and sisters of the RGV just voted on Proposition Number 6 this Tuesday, and that asked a question, and that question was, should everyone in Texas have the right to clean air, safe water, and a healthy environment? In Cameron County, 14,000 people voted in favor of that proposition. And if you add the 39,000 from Hidalgo County, that brings us to 53,000 people who are not here who believe that we deserve clean air and clean water. 
It is companies like your company or, you know, the people that you're representing or that you're here to basically help. Because let's face it, Texas is bought and sold. We all know that. You all are just sitting here because you have to, not because you want to. This isn't your home. This is my home. This is our home. Do the right thing. We are people of color. This is environmental racism. You have one minute. Do the right thing. These are my children. These are their children, their grandchildren. These are our fishing waters. What goes up must come down. Those chemicals we all talked about, they will be in our fishing waters. They will contaminate them. People go and fish there for free. We don't have a lot of money, but we are rich in our environment. And you're about to bankrupt us if you decide to pass this air permit. Thank you. Did you uh, fill in? No, I'll sign it. Okay, yeah, just stop by the table on your way out. Go ahead and state your name and then provide your comments. Uh, my name is Jesus Rodriguez, and I've heard a lot of uh, condemnation. But I tell you one thing. This, there are a whole bunch of people that are sick right now. And there were no LNG. There's a lot of cancer already here. Where did that all come from? Are they going to blame that on LNG? We have a lot of veterans here. Veterans that fought to give you all the right to speak here. And I'm upset because we didn't have a choice. There was no other way. We either joined the army or we'd be thrown in jail for messing up. There are a lot of people here that are poor that didn't get a chance to speak. Most of these people here are new to Brownsville or acting like something else that they're not. The real people from Brownsville are the sick people that are out there that didn't get a chance to talk. Poverty is the enemy. I mean, th we've been uh, destroying and polluting since we started. So we can't, we can't say now that this is the thing that's doing it. What we need is for our children to have a place to stay here and find a job, not to have to move out. All of our children moved out and other people came in. We need uh, good leadership, right, from Washington, D.C. We need a lot of Democrats. All right? You're not going to like that. Hold on. You? It's this gentleman's time. Go ahead. So I think that's where we're at, and we need, we need jobs. Most of the jobs that we have right now that the other lady was talking about was uh, maids, janitors, all those low jobs. Those are the kind of jobs we've had. We need better jobs for this area. We need companies like this that are coming in. And they're going to come in anyway. X is already here. They'll, I mean, you can't stop progress. It's going to come whether you like it or not. And I just don't agree... I didn't come in here to speak. I wasn't going to say anything. But when they start pointing at us and saying, look at the veterans minute. over there, and they're not doing anything to protect us, we did it already. And now what we need is for our children to have a future. Thank you. Thank you. Claire Krebs. Good evening. My name is Claire Krebs. I'm part of the University of Texas School of Law Environmental Clinic, which is working with the Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. Together, we represent the organization Vecinos para el Bienestar de la Comunidad Costera and the organization Shrimpers and the Fishermen of the RGV. We have reviewed the company's application and draft permit, and our clients have grave concerns about the facility's effect on the environment. The facility as designed will not be protective of public health, welfare, and property as required by Texas law. The Rio Grande facility will vastly eclipse any existing source of air pollution in the valley. The pollution that even the company estimates is many, many times larger than any of the other sources in the valley, including the natural gas plants. This pollution can cause short-term effects like asthma and long-term effects like cancer. This pollution can harm marine environments directly and cause acid rain, and the company predicts millions of tons of carbon dioxide and methane will be released every year, contributing to climate change. 
And this millions of tons of pollution is the pollution that the company expects, that is routine, that is part of their business. The estimates in the draft permit do not include pollution from upsets or emergencies, so the actual levels will be much more. The estimates in many cases rely on unsubstantiated assumptions and do not reflect what other LNG facilities emit. Texas law also requires that the facility use, at a minimum, the best available control technology to prevent excess air pollution from the facility's equipment, equipment from small valves to massive compressor turbines. The law requires that the company cast a wide net in searching for the best control technology. Instead, the company has looked too narrowly. It has overestimated the cost of better technologies. As a result, the TCEQ permit allows them to use cheaper, worse control technology that will let even more tons of pollutants into the air. This facility will also bring much more ship and truck traffic to the area. 300 to 400 massive LNG tankers, some of the biggest ships in the world, will use the channel every year. That's one a day. Those ships will be bringing tons of ballast water from across the world, which could also destroy marine life. These things are especially concerning to our shrimper clients. The application and permit also do not address environmental justice issues. Many of the people living, working, and recreating nearby are low-income or minority. The population from this, the pollution from this facility will disproportionately impact these people, which include members of the vecinos. We will be submitting detailed written comments on behalf of our clients later this month. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ed? Uh, go ahead and state your name for the record and then provide your comments. My name is Patricio Garza. I uh, heard a lot of negative comments today, a whole bunch of negative comments, a couple of positives. The way I see this, we have a company that's coming into our uh, neighborhood. They have a plan. They submitted their plan. The commission reviews the plan. According to the guidelines, which everybody's aware of, and they're national guidelines. They're not made up guidelines. They pass or they don't pass. And that's why we're, we're here today to voice our opinions. And that is it. They will do their job based on what is submitted to them. They're not biased. Uh, us being here, voicing our concerns, is, and all I heard was a whole bunch of ifs. What is this? What is that? What is it? I came here to listen to guarantees from the opposition, hoping you guys would change my mind. Well, I have definitely proved that LNG has done this in the past. They have a very good record. This is not their first game. They are... They are I think it's been like 10, 12 companies, plants that are already established. They have a strong safety record. All I heard was a whole bunch of ifs, everything from religion to fracking to uh, self-promotion, uh, you know, out there on left field, something about Harvey and stuff like that. That's, we're not here about that. We're here to... To welcome progress in the RGV. I left 40 years ago. I got my bachelor's. I could not get a decent job here. I left 40 years ago, and I am from Houston. I came back to retire, and I came back, and the valley is basically the same. Uh, I don't Just understand. One uh, Puerto Bronzo has expanded, and we do have some uh, uh, wind turbines out there. But basically, it's the same. We need to get new industry in here. Uh, them, can you imagine uh, from Bronzeville to Puerto Sabel, nothing but new businesses out there, as well as Bronzeville to Boca Chica? We got SpaceX. I mean, the possibilities are endless, but this is the first step. 
We need to take baby steps to bring more uh, commerce, more industry to the Rio Grande Valley. Um, I'm retired. My days are gone. My career is over. My kid left for Houston. He thought they're studying, got his bachelor's, uh, graduated on a Friday. By Monday, he got a job. Bilingual, good for him, and he left. There was nothing for him here. Thank you. I'll, I'll say we give these guys a chance. All right, thank you. You saw one of our registration forms. Yeah. Is Marlene Chavez. Good evening. My name is Marlene Chavez, and I am the Colonia's Policy Analysis and Educator for Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. As a legal advocate, my concern is TCEQ's failure to offer Spanish translation services today. More concerning is the fact that the notice did not mention a process on how to request translation services. Despite this barrier, my colleagues did make a request for these services to be provided, and yet they were not. TCEQ knows the demographics of the area where the LNG facility is proposed to be installed, knows the surrounding communities, one of them being Laguna Heights, which is largely composed of low-income families whose primary language is Spanish. Given these facts, it is TCEQ's civil responsibility to assure the participation and inclusion of everyone, no matter their language, race, nationality, ethnicity, religion, who will be impacted and affected by these facilities. It is TCEQ's duty to provide translation for individuals whose language is other than English. Desafortunadamente, hoy día, las voces de muchos residentes no fueron escuchados. Thank you. Thank you. Did you fill out one of our registration sheets? I did not. But okay. I will when I'm done. Uh, that'd be great. Go ahead and state your name and then provide your comments. All right. My name is Brian Parras. I'm from Houston, Texas. And uh, a lot of folks have asked you to do your job. I'm going to ask you to do more than your job because I think, as many folks have articulated, you know, the cards are stacked against communities. And oftentimes, if you just look at the laws as they're written and your role in that, a lot is missed. Some of those have been talked about today. I'm going to try and just mention a few that I think about often and I hope all of you think about as well. Um, like I said, I live in Houston, but my dad did live down here in the Valley for about 10 years. He was an organizer with AFSCME um, and organized city, state, municipal employees. So I spent some time down here, and I've been fishing in Boca Chica. I've been to South Padre Island. And my family is from West Texas in the frack fields in the Permian Basin. So it's, it's important for us to think about this larger community that will be impacted by this one facility. You know, as, as we know, it's the largest, and this gas has to come from somewhere. You know, it's not just the people here who will be impacted. It's hundreds of thousands of people all over the state of Texas. And we've seen the ramifications of fracking in Oklahoma, which is now earthquake capital of the U.S., maybe the world. We've seen wastewater contaminate wells and enter people's homes. You know, these are other things to consider. For folks here, I would say that there are a lot of psychosocial impacts that happen as well. I would guess that most of the jobs that are coming are for men. Yeah. Single young men, probably not from here either. Probably from somewhere else. And what, what comes with that? Bars, drugs, a lot of other industries that have been well noted in North Dakota, in the frack fields there, well noted in the frack fields, in the man camps in West Texas, here, not too far in Eagle Ford. These are also other impacts that may not be part of your air permit process, but will impact the people here and will affect their health and will also impact the environment. They mentioned more trucks, more traffic. If they build it, they will come and they will keep coming. 
And they'll build more and more and more because they don't stop. There's a precedent that's being set. And this is a very special place. Very special place. One of the first places that Europeans made landfall to um, over 500 years ago. And, you know, we had some relatives speak very nicely about that as well. Uh, The cultural genocide that has happened here will continue to happen if we allow these massive projects to take place. And imagine all the loss of knowledge and history that we'll never have because of the destruction of the land um, that uh, will no doubt take place from the drilling and the digging and the building. That's your time. Thank you. Did you fill out one of our registration forms? Yes, sir, I will, and I'm way out. Okay, thank I'm you. Go ahead, chair, state your name. My name's Tony Garcia, and I'm going to be the chair because I'm a disabled veteran. Okay, go ahead and grab the microphone yeah. and then uh, provide your comments. Okay, uh, what I want to say is that I saw and felt a lot of anger here. This is not the type of people we are here in this valley. We're not an angry people. There's an opportunity here for the community to grow in more ways and financially. I'm concerned about the air pollution. I live here. I was born here. And I'm going to die here. And what I feel, you know, just people on this side here, they had the majority of the time. I don't think they got their point across because when you're angry, you make mistakes. And I really felt from the bottom of my heart that these people have a lot of anger in them. They talk about our land, our people. Well, I'm part of the people, and this is my land too. And I would welcome Rio Grande LNG here. I really would. I know when Chu and some of my veteran friends, we got back from Vietnam, we had no jobs. I got two kids with high college degrees. They couldn't find a job here. They went to San Antonio. They're never coming back. There's nothing here. This is an opportunity for our grandkids to stay here in the valley. And I want my kids, grandkids to stay here. Uh, in Brownsville, I remember years ago, we had a chance for Lockheed to come to Brownsville. And there were folks from Brownsville that were opposed to that. They went to Harlingen. Years and years ago, they wanted to build a weird here in Brownsville that would save a lot of water. There was a lot of people from the Sierra Club that opposed it. They were against it. And we lost billions of gallons of water that we could use. We have to look beyond, you know, uh, today. Unfortunately, natural gas and all the petroleum products they're a necessary evil, if you want to say that. But we need it. We have the we have the highest standard of living in the world. And why do we have it? Because of gas and petroleum products. You have one minute. So I want to say, you know, they usually say that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Well, here I think that my friends here to my right, I think they're missing the board here. You know, we all are very familiar with the Sierra Club. You know, we know what they stand for. We know what they've done on the West Coast, uh, you know, to prevent progress. Progress is coming anyway. If we don't take advantage of it, we're going to be a third world here in the United States. We're pretty close to that, and we have an opportunity to advance, but we have to be positive. Uh, thank you. That's all I have to say. All right. Thank you. Lance Lozano. Howdy. My name is Lance Lozano. Um, I'm 24 years old, born and raised here in Brownsville, Texas. Hey, go ahead and pull oh, the microphone sorry. Out. My name is Lance Lozano. Um, I'm 24 years old. I was born and raised here in Brownsville, Texas. Um, I'm a big science fiction nerd. I don't know if anyone in here is, but does anybody know Star Trek? A few people? Yeah, but good. So, one of my favorite characters, Spock, has this saying, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Clearly, that is not the case. And what saddens me is that we have the knowledge and the power to transform our way of 
moving forward, progress, business. It saddens me that we still rely on information that is completely false. I went to Texas A&M. I was in the College of Geosciences. My specialty was geography, more specifically the effects of climate change and how the fossil fuel industry played a role in it. I studied plenty of environmental justice cases. It's clear that there is something very fraudulent in our system. It's broken. Now, I'm not going to play the blade game here, but what I am going to say is that there are hundreds of cases in the state alone, ranging from Beaumont to Corpus to the uh, Eagle Fort Shale up to north of Fort Worth where they're trying to allow fracking in places like Denton, which, if I recall correctly, the state reversed their city ordinance to not let fracking happen. It's, it's kind of sad. And I'm hoping one day, if I'm fortunate enough to have kids, to bring down here to visit the island, show them where I grew up, where I had fun. And I don't want them to inhale the chemicals that causes asthma and all types of cancerous um, things. It's not fair to these people. It's not fair to my family. And I'm hoping that you guys look at all this information because people have given you a lot to think about, obviously. But consider putting yourself in their shoes, in their and where they come from. Imagine you waking up one morning, looking outside your house, and there's that big LNG plant. I don't know about you, but inhaling that kind of air and finding it okay is kind of asinine. Nay, it's really asinine. And I, for one, just cannot stand to see that happen. Now, unfortunately, I have a good idea of what you guys are going to decide. That's the sad truth. It's a, it's a gut feeling, just considering the history that Texas has had with this particular industry. But please, look at, your, look at the moral thing. What's the right thing to do? Imagine if it was your children being in this zone. I don't know about you, but I have a gut feeling that you guys wouldn't be comfortable with that as much as they are, or I am. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. To conclude, I will briefly discuss the National Air Standards contesting the air permit and things I heard during the air permit uh, public meeting that are in demand. So the EPA sets the National Ambient Air Quality Standards for six principal criteria pollutants. Uh, ground level ozone, lead, carbon monoxide, nitro uh, nitrogen uh, dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and particulate matter. Areas that do not meet or contribute to ambient air quality in a nearby area that does not meet the national air standards are designated non-attainment. Areas that meet the national air standards are designated attainment. And areas that cannot be classified based on available information are de designated unclassified, unclassifiable. For also, the Federal Clean Air Act establishes non-attainment classifications ranked according to the severity of the area's air per, uh, pollution problem. These classifications, marginal, moderate, serious, severe, and extreme, translates to various uh, requirements with which Texas and non-attainment areas must comply. Once classified as non-attainment, then you go into the Texas State Implementation Plan, which is the state's comprehensive plan to come back into compliance by cleaning the air and meeting federal air quality standards. This is currently the case for locations like El Paso, Austin, San Antonio, Corpus Christi, Victoria, Houston, Galveston, Brasoria, uh, where the uh, Freeport LNG facility is located, Beaumont, Port, uh, Port Arthur, nor Northeast Texas, and Dallas, Fort Worth. When the Texas, uh, when the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality's uh, executive director has determined that the application meets all the requirements of the standard air permit authorized by Title 30, Texas Administrative Code Chapter 116.611 which uh, would establish the conditions under uh, which the plant will operate. The executive director will make a preliminary decision to issue the registration because it meets all the uh, applicable rules. The executive director will consider all timely file comments to determine whether any issue that were raised require changes to the preliminary decision on the proposed permit uh, and prepare a written response to all relevant uh, comments. The executive director's response and decision are sent to the mailing list, including all the commenters. This response provides a final 30-day period to request a contested case hearing. This may be some exception depending on the air permit application 
If the TCEQ receives no request for the hearing on the application and it meets all the applicable requirements, the executive director may issue the permit. Once the executive director decision has been released, there are three possible ways to contest it. You could request a contested ca case hearing, request, request its reconsideration, or move to overturn. The, the contested case hearing would be a legal proceeding similar to a civil trial in, dis in state district court. To request to be a party, you must attend the preliminary hearing and show you will be affected by the application in a way not common to the general public. Any person may attend the preliminary hearing and request to be a party. Only persons named as parties may participate at the contested case hearing. At the contest, at the contested case hearing, check out the TCQ's website for detailed information about the contesting process. And cities in this area, like Port Isabel and others, want to contest the air permits, but HB 40 prevents any local leader from stopping this permit as state Democrats like Oliveira and the Lucios voted for HB 40. This is where a dedicated and well-funded le well legal team would be recommended, uh, as I highly doubt that local leaders would be successful in blocking the air permits, nor risk direct action against the exporting facilities once all legal proceedings are completed as required by law. These exporting facilities will create precedents for more heavy polluters to come and expand unsustainable energy sources that contribute to climate change. The state environmental agency has resources like the public education program that you can learn from and review on their website. But, if, but I recommend to have a legal uh, team helping the environmental groups fighting these facilities. Okay, things I heard during the public meeting that opponents demanded from the process. Air monitors next to the LNG facilities with additional background air monitors from the existing ones. This public demand is very common and I suspect, I suspect you would have to have more heavy polluters in the area to obtain more monitors in the area. If you don't want more heavy polluters in the area to obtain additional air monitors, then pressure Texas legislators to increase the state environmental agency's budget. Having one local leader in the National Resource Committee is obviously not enough. Other demands or specifically threats made were selling houses, condos, and moving out. These threats came mostly from winter Texans that love and travel to the RGV subtropical climate and contribute to the region's uh, ecotourism and general economy. Okay, with all that said, this is a long-term contest that will be here for the foreseeable future, and I doubt this will be the last time I talk about this. I leave you with one of the commenter's words. These public meetings are a demonstration of the power that we hope we can have. The next episode will be about the Brownsville Navigation District Commissioner election that is on May 5th, 2018. On the ballot for place two is John Wood and Cesar Lopez. And on the ballot for place four is Javier Vera, Steve Guerra, and Patrick Anderson. Early election runs April 23rd through May 1st. Check out the Cameron County Elections Department's website for more information. That does it for this month's show. If you're not a Patreon, sign up and make a pledge. Until next time, this is Patrick Everett. My name is Patrick Anderson, and if you believe that this development is not good for our region and is not a good idea for the Port of Brownsville, you can additionally show up to the polls in late April and early May. I am a candidate for the Port of Brownsville, and I believe that we can do better. Thank you.